Good morning and welcome to the Brattleboro Citizens Breakfast. We have the honor of having all five candidates for uh, State Senate in Wyndham County present. Uh, you'll find them on the ballot in alphabetical order. So we probably should go in alphabetical order. The candidates will give a about two minute direct presentation uh, and then we'll open up for questions. The questions have been submitted on index cards and I'll try to collate them. I'll give those questions uh, to the candidates when it's time. Um, in alphabetical order then, um, we have today Becca Valen. See if I can keep my alphabet straight. Aaron Diamondstone, um, Jerry Levy, uh, David Scholes, and Jeanette White. We had a good turnout. I was a little worried when I stuck my head out this morning, and I know there was a tree down on South Main. I'm sure there are some other trees around town, so I'm glad to see everybody out this morning. So I'm Becca Ballant. I live here in Brattleboro with my spouse and two children. I have a son who's going to be nine in a couple weeks and a daughter who's six. I go to public schools here in Brattleboro. Before running for the legislature, I was a teacher here in Wyndham County. I taught, taught in three different public schools, uh, mostly history and civics, though I also did a little bit of health. And um, as we do here in Vermont, you fill in where, where needed. It's been a tremendous honor to serve in the legislature. I've, I've loved my time. I've loved working for all of you. And I was thinking this morning as I was uh, getting ready to come here that we often say in the legislature that it is like sucking on a fire hose between January and May because the information comes so fast and furious and you're just trying to catch your breath. But I was thinking that that was not exactly what my experience was for the last two years. And one of the things that I do to um, keep my sanity is I take vocal jazz lessons. And serving the legislature is a lot like jazz. Sometimes it's really frenetic and you're off tempo and sometimes you're in the flow, but it always requires constant deep listening to hear when it's time to enter into a conversation and when it's time to hold back. And I am very much looking forward to continuing to serve you in the legislature. There are many specific initiatives that I can talk about, but one that I know doesn't always come up in my biography, something that I'm very proud of, is that I'm one of two legislators that serves on the fair and impartial policing team. <laughs> something I'm very committed to, the issue of racial justice. I also serve on a subcommittee of that, looking at how do we do better outreach between law enforcement and civilians so that we can make sure we have the systems in place to prevent any kind of dangerous, violent, violent situation involving law enforcement and Vermonters. So I look forward to the questions. Good morning. I'm really uncomfortable doing this, um, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I'm putting my name on the ballot for this job um, for several reasons. One is party building. Um, our, in my view, my judgments are that our political process is lacking some things at this point. Um, and it's been a goal of mine to try to create a more productive process. So an alternative party um, that doesn't necessarily stick to mainstream ideas is, is kind of where I'm at. Um, and then I've, I'm, I'm doing this because in the big picture, things don't look very good to me. Um, and a place to start is right here in Wyndham County. Vermont, Vermont, in my opinion, has been a um, trendsetter. And Wyndham County has been the base of that in Vermont in some instances. Um, I'm an anti capitalist candidate. Um, I don't believe in the word profit. Uh, I believe any profit that's made, any excess money, is um, comes from one of two places. Either labor has to be paid a fair amount for their work, 
for the true cost of the product <coughs> hasn't been paid. Uh, and the prime examples that come to mind for me are Vermont Yankee, where um, Entergy and Green Mountain Power and CBPS made their profits and then left us with radioactive waste on the bank of the Connecticut River. Um, the other prime example that comes to mind is the company in North Bennington and Pottle and Falls <coughs> that made Teflon coated frying pans and we paid the price for it. We're paying the price for it. The people that live there are paying the price for it. Um, so I don't believe, and those are the two prime examples of how there is no such thing as profit. Any excess money is coming out of our pockets because it's polluting our air, our water, and our land. Um, so I think capitalism is a failure. And, and the, other, the other reason I believe that is that it's built on growth. GDP has to grow, town tax bases have to grow, corporate profits have to grow, and in the end, the only growth there really is is population growth. And I believe the planet has enough people on it. We can barely sustain people that are here now. And there are people that are hungry and don't have houses. And those are my main concerns. Um, and this is the place to start. If elected, I would drop my disparate activities for two years and represent the people of Wyndham County with the same enthusiasm and dedication with which I've conducted my life as a teacher, actor, musician, philanthropist with a small team and other things. I appreciate uh, what Jeanette, the sacrifices Jeanette White has made to represent us. And I am fully prepared to do the same thing. What I would focus on as your senator is of course many of the ideas that uh, my colleague Aaron brought up. But as you know, I am particularly concerned with the problems of youth, education, inequality, income inequality, um, what have become mainstream ideas because of the campaign of Bernie Sanders needs to be brought to Vermont as diplomatically but forcefully. I would try and find out what research has been done about income inequality and the concentration of wealth. And I have some creative ideas for beginning to alleviate that in the civil way with which we conduct ourselves in the legislature. So that I would, uh, I, I think first of all, we, <clears throat> we need a state bank to uh, begin to harness the money we need to uh, fund all our services, which whether we like it or not, are competing with each other for limited funds. And that state bank could be contributed to by private parties, but it would be particularly to raise funds for youth services, for the elderly, for the hungry, for the homeless. Ways we always say we don't have enough money for because of market forces. We have to get beyond market forces and begin to say, instead of what can we afford, say, what do we need? And harness all of the qualified people, your friends, who are unemployed and underemployed. Give them the work they need so their talents, which are often not being used because of market forces, can be used. Thank you. Here in uh, 1970 to attend Antioch Graduate School. I've been here pretty much ever since. I've been involved in community service and public service since I was a kid uh, shoveling the, the church steps and sidewalk uh, on Sunday mornings. I've been a member of uh, Land Trust Board, the Health Center Board, Daycare Board, the Union Board, the seven years on the school board, and four years on the, the town select board. I've also been on the Waste Management District Board for four years. Um, I'm a member of the Wyndham, Wyndham County <coughs> Hunger Council. I attend the Fit and Healthy Kids Coalition meetings, the Town Energy Committee, the Town Arts Committee, and I'm the Wyndham County, one of the two Wyndham County representatives on the Vermont School Board Association. I also occasionally get to the West Brattleboro Association meetings, but they're scheduled the same night as the Waste Management District Board, so I can't make most of them. 
But as a member of the Waste Management Board, actually before that, as a member of the Select Board, I um, lobbied Senator Galbraith to change the, the, uh, the law about uh, net metering about solar projects so the towns could collaborate on, the, uh, on a, 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 an array and uh, then joined the Waste Management Board and promoted the uh, creation of a five megawatt solar array on the dump, which is uh, the contract is out, the work is being done, the permitting is being done, the Public Service Board is going to get the application probably uh, in a couple of weeks and it's going to generate significant income, a couple of million dollars over 20 years in lease income that will go to defray the cost of recycling and waste management and reduce electric rates for every town in the county. So I think through all of these things, through all of this work and all this committee work and board work, I think I've learned, I've clearly learned to, to work effectively with my neighbors to get things done. I'm enthusiastic, I'm consistent, I'm very, I'm responsive, and I think that I'm, I'm good at getting things done. And I'm looking forward to your questions because I'd like to tell you some of the specific things that I'm particularly interested in. Thank you. Thank you. So for 14 years I've served Wyndham County and the state of Vermont and it's been a real honor and actually as the years go by I realize more and more what an honor it is because during those 14 years I'm sure I've managed to make everybody in Wyndham County angry at me at least <laughs> one time either about a bill or an issue or an unreturned phone call or some other reason that um, to be mad at me but I love going back and I um, it is more of an honor to the, your support for me that I have that you apparently trust my judgment so even if we disagree on one or two issues you trust my judgment so it also becomes harder and harder to answer questions and talk about successes and failures in two minutes because you realize the complexity of the issues so I'm not going to go into any real issues here. I'm just going to say that I'm running again because I love public policy. And what I love about it is the ability to take an issue and look at it from <coughs> two, four, ten sides and all those different approaches to that issue, put them together, listen respectfully to everybody, and then come up with a solution that seems to serve Vermont and Wyndham County in the best way. And it is really hard. And it also is about compromise. And I know that some people think compromise is a bad word. But if we didn't compromise and didn't have the ability to work with people with whom we disagree, we would have the same kind of gridlock that they have in Washington. So it is really important that we be able to work with our colleagues with whom we disagree. Um, I serve on, and I have the relation, I've built relationships and can do that. And I think I'm a, voice for civil um, discourse in the Senate and try very hard to make sure that we remain civil. I'm on two committees, Judiciary and Government Operations. Those of you who don't know me, I grew up in rural Minnesota on a farm family, and for those who do know me, you know I can talk forever, so I'll just stop and let you ask questions. Thank you. Uh, rank several issues. Now, I guess rank would be prioritized, right? Rank several issues that you consider most important or of highest priority and and or or alternatively what do you personally want to get or already get out of serving in public office uh, well the first thing i got out of public service is it, it gives meaning to my life i don't know how else to to say it um, working with a group of people like the select board in the last four or five years has, has been just it's incredibly rewarding to sit down with people and work through the kind of problems that you face in this in this town and listen and, and struggle and then come to a consensus, which we have regularly done, I think, in a pretty effective way. The same is true of the school board until recently. Um, Act 46 has made that much more difficult and has really divided the schools across this district and, it's, and the school boards across this district, and it's very discouraging. I think the number one thing that I want to work on, I don't know that it's necessarily the most important problem facing the state, but the number one thing that I want to work, work on is getting all the resources that we apply to fight poverty, to get families out of poverty, coordinated and used much more efficiently so that people don't have to go from agency to agency to agency filling out forms. They don't have to then drive back halfway across the county because they forgot some income 
uh, income information or some other some other form that they have to have. But to simplify and and just make that much more efficient. And uh, there's a con there's a commission looking across the state right now, looking at at doing that very thing. And Paul Costello is one of the people on that commission, and they're coming up with some excellent recommendations. But one of the things that they, I read in an article about this, and I think it was in the Digger, was that um, when they, they've been talking to the agency heads in Montpelier, and the, the explanation they get is that they have policies and the, the procedures and everything in place, and they send them down to the, the worker bees, which is the way they describe the people that provide those services in our community. And the worker bees somehow don't quite, aren't quite able to handle it, to make it work. And my feeling is, I, deeply that the problem is not that. The problem is the information going the other way. That they are not listening to the people down here who know what's going on. I talked to human service people across the county, across, and particularly in this town. There are lots of organizations like the Prouty Center and the Groundworks Collaborative and, and lots of coalitions. There are 40 organizations on the Wyndham County Hunger Council all working on food security. They try to coordinate as much as they can. But they're constantly running into obstacles. They're constantly running into problems, and it has to do with the bureaucracy at the top. And that's what I want to do: is go up there and try and change that. Last year, I testified in front of Senate Ed on Act 46, and I tried to make the point to them that the thing that was driving up our school costs is poverty. It's the extra adults that we have to have in the schools to work with kindergartners who don't know how to toilet themselves who have never followed direction, who have never had to sit still, who have not been involved in a conversation other than being shouted at for most of their, for their early five years of their life. This requires a lot more resources, and it doesn't stop after kindergarten, it doesn't stop after third grade, and they're starting to read, the resources are needed all the way through. The Senate, I, I like to think I had a part in this, they, they included a section in Act 46, Section 49, that asked the Agency of Education and the Human Services Agencies to come up with a study to systematically to, to change the system, the way they are approaching their work, and deal with and cooperate better between just themselves, never mind all the other agencies and, and private and public organizations and foundations that are around. And the report came back, it was supposed to come back last January, it came back last January. It was, I don't, know, I don't, like, I don't want to use a modifier, it was inadequate. They, they talked about behavior as the problem that they would work on, and they like, the quote is, buckle down and work harder on the behavior issue, and that's the way they responded. So I went back to the agency, or went back to the, the Senate Committee, and I told them, I gave them a, my criticisms of the, of, the bill, of the report. They agreed and, and said they were gonna get out, they would get on it again in this session, but the, 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 the response was just inadequate, and that's the problem. They talked they talk to themselves, among the top of the agencies, and they don't talk to the people that are down here doing the work who actually know what people need. And if we don't provide services to surround families with the things that they need, food, shelter, preschool for the kids, a, tra a job training opportunity, an internship, a, a CCB or a folk rehab opportunity to get training so that they can get themselves out of poverty, it's, we're gonna continue to have that problem that it sucks money out of every single agency. and it, it, damages our communities, obviously crime is up, it, it contributes to the opioid crisis and drug abuse. It, to me, poverty and the ineffectiveness <coughs> of the current approach to getting families, whole families out of poverty is the biggest problem. So, the, obviously the overriding issues are the budget and how we um, create a budget that does not affect those most vulnerable. And that's really hard to do because every advocacy group wants to make sure that their constituents are well served. And so it's a balancing act. How do you create that budget? I, I do believe that um, there are three issues that I am going to just address. I'm just going to rattle them off that I think I need to spend some time on this year because we're assigned to committees. And so the most of our time is spent dealing with issues before those committees. So three of the issues that I am most concerned about are continuing our health care reform, making sure that we have universal access to health care, and that we control costs. I also believe that law enforcement is a huge issue in this state. How we provide law enforcement for the entire county, or the entire state, we have 80 different law enforcement entities in this state in addition to the Vermont State Police. They all have different policies, they all have different 
approaches. They all have different pay schedules, retirement um, funds, and we need to have a better coordinated system of law enforcement. So that's an issue that I've been dealing with for a while, and I plan to really take it on this year. And believe me, whenever you take on law enforcement, a lot of people get very angry at you. But I'm going to take it on this year, hopefully. The other issue that I think is very important is promoting open, transparent, and participatory government. That, to me, is the basis of our whole democracy. And if we do not have that, then we've lost um, all those other issues are secondary, in my mind, if we don't have a good, open, transparent, and participatory democracy in government. So with that, I'll stop. There is a relationship between the problem of education, the problem of youth, and the problem of poverty and hunger. Um, basically, kids going to school should be paid. They should learn in school that the school leads directly to employment and, and or preparation for college. The hundreds, perhaps thousands of people in Vermont who are qualified teachers, youth workers, should be employed. So there's a relationship between services, what we have to do in education, and the concentration of wealth, and income inequality, and the tax structure. And the lack of unlimited money to provide, to, to, to link up the qualified people with the people who need help. So that we have to begin to talk about and act upon these issues. I'm not just an armchair sociologist. I've published two books on education. I'm an expert on the problems of youth in education. And I'm ready to apply some of my ideas directly. I think these problems are solvable, but I think we have to begin to think about them in a different way. One of the things that I think is really important for all of us to think about is that in the next 15 years, we are going to overtake Maine as the state with the uh, demographics that show that we have the most aging population here in Vermont. So by Yes, within 15 years, we will have the most seniors per capita. So a quarter of our population in Vermont will be elderly. There are many, many issues that you can imagine that would connect to those changing demographics. And I think often what I see when I walk around talking to voters is that people often try to put pit the needs of the younger generation, the millennials, and the needs of seniors against each other. And the fact is, they're almost identical. So when you survey Vermonters who are over the age of 65, their top five concerns are financial security, housing, health care, transportation, all of which are also strong concerns of young families looking to move here. The one in which they differ, the fifth for um, elderly folks is long-term care and how to afford that and how to make sure that SA programs like SASH and um, that you have uh, a variety of options for staying in your home and getting the care that you need. And for younger people, it's um, child care affordability. And so one of the things that I'm thinking about is how do you bridge the gap between these two groups that have incredible needs to be able to stay here in Vermont and for it to be affordable and for us to not work against each other. It's not either or. It's not meeting the needs of millennials or meeting the needs of seniors. We want a healthy economy going forward. We want healthy communities and that means that everyone needs to feel included in the conversation and the solutions about those those, those issues. So, my priorities. I, um, I belong to the theory of nonviolent communication, where everybody's needs are valued equal, and we all have the same needs, the exact same needs: food, clothing, shelter, safety, support, to have power in the world. Um, and I also belong to a men's group. Um, 
where part of my mission statement is to co-create a world of peace, justice, and equity. And I believe that <coughs> it may be painful some of the changes I think we need to make, but I guess I'd like to, to invite you to each just if you feel comfortable, take a look at the person next to you. And then quietly to assess to yourself, do you think your time is more valuable than theirs is? Do you think you're better than they are? No, I, I contend that all of us are valuable members of society and that we all deserve the same treatment, the same pay, the same health insurance. Um, and I guess one of my main concerns, my main priorities if I went to Montpelier was to make sure that people weren't making a so-called profit on health insurance. So maybe we can do this one on a show of hands. So uh, that, will, that will get on video. Has each candidate followed the Secretary of State's campaign finance requirements? All those who say yes, please raise, raise your hand. Okay, and those who haven't, a brief, a very brief explanation. <clears throat> My brief explanation is that I don't seek funds to run my quote campaign, so I see no need of filing anything. Pretty much the same thing. I, I haven't got a donation. I haven't spent a dime. I don't know what the state secretary or treasurer's requirements are, but I'm sure I haven't violated any of my own principles. This question, because it's very timely, it's in the news. Uh, I don't know if the audience knows about it. Uh, can you explain uh, what the all-payer health care is and what your position is on it? So, briefly, uh, the, the state has made an arrangement with the federal government to go to a different kind of payment structure for practitioners so they won't be paid on fee for service and itemize a bill for service, but rather look at health outcomes of the patient. I heard uh, the chair of the Green Mountain Board say that the spend for that patient would come along with the patient when that patient went to the all-payer ACO that's going to be established. That's very quickly. What's your position on all-payer? Because the new governor can actually get out of that. This is a, a very complicated issue, but essentially it's a provider-run system, not run by the state, and I support it. And I support moving forward and working out the details. Seems like a good idea. I'd have to know more about it. I don't, I don't need to be on camera anyway, so. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know a lot about it either, but one of the things that comes to mind is I do like to try and take things in and evaluate them and listen before I make a decision. And um, one of the things that, that, like the extreme example to me is what happens if somebody dies? Um, and it's going to happen to all of us, so I don't know how people get paid. It was interesting, two days after the forum we had at the Brattleboro retreat about the all-payer waiver, I went to my doctor to have a mole removed on my neck. And I was in the chair, and she's getting ready to do the procedure, and she said, before I do this, can we just talk all pair waiver for a few minutes? <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, we're all used to that, and that's what happens if you go. And so, um, and that was one of several doctors who talked to me about it. The bottom line is what we're doing isn't working. We know that. Costs keep going up. The concerns that I have, and I, I'm married to a healthcare attorney, so we talk a lot about this at home in the details. The concern I have is in Wyndham County in particular, we have an, an, an aging population and we have, uh, as David has spoken to, as Jeanette and I know from our work, we have a lot of poverty here in Wyndham County. So in talking with several of the um, providers, I know they're concerned about the level of care they need to give because of our high risk population and what will happen if that block grant funding runs out. So I do have concerns about the details but I applaud the governor and the Green Mountain Care Board for moving forward on a different model because what we're doing isn't working. So whether it's uh, Phil Scott or whether it's Sue Minter, uh, each can decide to pursue it. 
or to take a different course. So I think it's important to try something new. I was uh, involved in the uh, lobbying for the single payer bill uh, about four years ago when it came to legislature, and I got to go to a lot of Greenmont Care Board meetings, and I was really impressed with the quality of the people and the thoroughness of their work and the staff that was working with them. And um, so when I heard about this, I looked pretty carefully at it. And it's, it's absolutely an improvement. It's an attempt to control costs, to get it away from the get every single service that you can because that's how you're going to get you send people for x-rays and CAT scans and all these things they may or may not need. And it's going to reward people for, uh, for, uh, for providing good service. It also is going to be, I was assured at the same meeting Becca talked about, I was assured that it will, that there will be a risk factor so that if you have a whole lot of sick people on your caseload, you're not going to suffer because they don't get a lot better and somebody else that only treats people that, that are, you know, that go to a health facility all the time is going to make out like a bandit because everybody's really healthy. It's not going to work that way. It's not the complete answer. It's, it's a start in the right direction to contain costs, which is one of the, the things we should be working on first. It's not the same as universal primary care, which will make a significant difference in cost, but it's much more, it's more expensive to implement than what they've come up with. So I think we should do what they're doing and then move directly into working toward universal primary care. Places like the Northeast Kingdom have to double the number of primary care physicians they have to even scratch the surface. So I support it as a good step forward. You're telling me. So I have a concern about legalizing marijuana. Are there unintended consequences? And does the increased revenue uh, coming from that proposal justify those unintended consequences? I support allowing adult Vermonters to grow a small plot of marijuana for their personal use. If the state wants to do something about it, give out licenses to large companies to come in and run a system, I'd rather we wait several years until the other states that are doing that or trying that see how it works out. California is looking at a bill that will um, allow five years of just local people to produce before they let the monopolies come in and, and mechanize the process. And um, I talked to the chief of police in Dover. I talked to or emailed Terry Martin and, and uh, mentioned that approach that having adults be able to grow their own plot for personal use or medicinal use and leave the system alone, leave the statewide system and a commercial system alone until we know what's really going on. And this, it, these days, you can buy the, re the scientific research result that you want. And the information, as a school board association member, we get a lot of information about marijuana legalization. And the stuff that we hear, coming particularly from Colorado, is so bogus that it's, you can't believe it. You can't possibly have an opinion or a, a, pers a position on, this, on the process of commercial sale based on the, the research that's been done because it contradicts itself all over the place. It's like, is coffee good for you or not good for you? So I support small plots for adults to grow their own, but the, the statewide system is absolutely a terrible idea at this point. This is a topic that I could talk about for about 27 minutes without even taking a breath and then keep going on from there. I sponsored a bill last year to legalize and regulate, not just legalize, but regulate marijuana for adult use. When we had testimony from kids in eighth grade, our pages who said, it is easier for us to get marijuana in the lavatory of our school than to get alcohol. I said, wow, that doesn't make any sense. If it's easier to get a non-regulated substance, let's regulate it so that it's harder for them to get. So I was convinced, that was one of the reasons, that I was convinced that we should do it. The bill that we put forward did not create monopolies. It was for small growers, limited size. You had to be a Vermonter to ha get a permit. You could not invest in a grow facility or a retail facility if you were not a Vermonter. And the t main issue that we heard about was impaired driving. And there are ways of dealing with that. And what the sheriff told us is that and we heard this from Colorado also. We, I, I was on this committee. We dealt with it for two years. Um, what the Colorado sheriffs told us is, if you get stopped right now for speeding, and they smell alcohol on your breath, bingo. They do a sobriety test right on the spot to see if you're impaired or not. If you get stopped for marijuana, and they smell, I mean, you get stopped for speeding and they smell marijuana, they forget all about the impaired driver test. 
what they do is they go after you to see if you've got other drugs in your car. That doesn't make any sense. So of course the impaired driver statistics are going to increase because we never um, arrested them before for impaired driving under marijuana. So there is a study that has come out from a thing called the Rocky Mountain High Institute. And what you need to know is that that is an arm of the DEA. So you can't, the, their statistics are okay, but they're all slanted in a certain direction. And we found that out when we talked to Colorado. The main issue here, I believe, is that this is a, an issue of a right. We have two substances that are probably bad for you, alcohol and marijuana. We put people in jail and we arrest them and give them a record if they use marijuana. We actually, as a state, sell you the other one and make a profit on it. So it, it's, um, um, it sounds hokey to say that it's a civil rights issue, but I do believe that it is. And we, the, um, we did not do this for the money, for the revenue that is generated from it. That's a side um, issue. I think it's a side benefit. But we did it because it's the right thing to do. And unfortunately, it didn't pass the House. This question came up because I know for some people in the community, they know that Senator White and I uh, disagreed a little bit on this issue. And we actually, I feel like, have, have worked well together in working through it and having continued dialogue about it. We sit on two different, well, we sit on four different committees. So she sits on two, I sit on two, and you, they don't overlap. So I sit on Senate uh, Economic Development and Housing, and I sit on Senate Institutions. And so we hear different witnesses, and we hear different testimony on a particular issue. And so in Senate Economic Development, I heard from small growers in Wyndham County who were very concerned about the bill that was uh, moving forward. And I advocated on my committee to make sure that there would be an opportunity for small growers to be part of this new economy. And I can get into the statistics about how the growing marijuana economy does not generally include women or people of color. It is um, the inequities in the general economy are also replicated in um, this new um, economic field. So I wanted to make sure those folks who were producing it would have an opportunity to be part of the new economy. As Jeanette knows, I am not um, someone who knew a lot about this issue until um, this came up before us in the Senate. And I met with people from the prevention community, from Brattleboro up to Bellows Falls, and I also met with people who represented the growers. And the interesting thing was they agreed on a lot. They agreed that we need to keep it out of the hands of children. We need to make sure that it really is a bill that will allow people to come out of the shadows so we can regulate it. And I just want to highlight a new study that came out in the last few months, and it's looking at the connection between marijuana use of people under the age of 25 and increased incidences of psychotic um, episodes. There's more research that needs to be done, but it's clear that if we move forward with legalization, that there is a correlation of younger marijuana user, users being three times more likely to have psychotic episodes than people over the age of 25. So that is data I'm gonna be looking at. It seems clear Massachusetts is moving forward on this, and I think we need to have our eyes open. I'm sure that there'll be unintended consequences. I think there are unintended consequences for everything we do. Um, every action, I'm, I'm totally convinced now that every step we take on this planet has an effect. I was walking through the woods and my wife said, oh look, the trees made steps for us. And I thought, no, so many people travel this path that the earth is there's no more grass and we have an impact with every step. So I'm sure there are unintended consequences. But I believe that marijuana should be legalized. Um, I'm not sure what system we should use. Um, I believe there should be backyard growers. But if there's any penalties, uh, if there's any profits, so-called profits, if there's extra money that the state earns, I believe that it should go to rehabilitation and law enforcement and um, it should be used. I'm close to people in recovery and um, they'd probably be really sad to hear me say that I think it should be legalized, but I think if the excess money that's produced from the sale of it and the regulation 
should be used to prevent people from feeling like they need it. And um, when I compare it to alcohol and tobacco, I think it's a much safer drug. I'm for the legalization of marijuana. I think there's a broad consensus amongst the five candidates here. Um, if elected, I will embrace the details of figuring out all the research and how it is best done, like the three of you have. I think it's really good the way you do that stuff. Um, so, but obviously, it should be legalized, and it is a civil rights issue. I want to thank you all for coming here and for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to uh, be at the breakfast and thank everyone attending at the breakfast. Uh, uh, thank you again.